Today on The Grave Talks, part two of our conversation about My Haunted Fowler with Dwight Sneathan. I did read about one man who was held there, Jacob Nelling. Yes. And he was accused of murdering a 15-year-old girl, brutally murdering her. Yes. And do, is he someone that they think is also there? Yeah, we believe that he did. He, well, he didn't get his day in court. So we believe that he's still there in some capacity. And the story goes that, and, you, and some of this you can read online. What I have found as I've done research is that the stories that have appeared here and then maybe further west and then stories in, like, say, California about this event, they, became, they become more salacious the further you get away from the town. Oh, that's and, interesting. Yeah. So what I've what I've come what we've come to surmise is that uh, we know the girl was murdered. The first person that was brought in for questioning was also named Jacob. The way I understand it, he accused the other Jacob. So the other Jacob was was brought in. He was taken to Tippecanoe County, a neighboring county, and held there until the night before his trial for his safety. the The stories read that he said he didn't didn't remember doing. It. But he must have sort of like he admitted to it, even though he really don't, doesn't remember doing it, um, which kind of side note, he was a Civil War veteran. And we wondered if there wasn't a little bit of PTSD at hand in that situation. You know, they didn't diagnose that back then. So they brought him back to the jail that night, the night before his trial, up to 100 men. Again, further west, story says 200, but it was about 100 men is what I understand had gone to the jail and basically told the sheriff to bring him out. The sheriff said, I'm not bringing him out, but if you want to come get him, I'm not going to stop you. It was three deputies versus 100 people. So they they broke into the east side of the jail, broke him out. They took him about 100 to 200 miles outside of the family home, and they, they hung him there. And then they put him on display in a town called Oxford the next day with a little note on his chest. A lot of this was in the story, was in the newspaper, we also have a picture. It's a photo of Jacob with his head to the side, men standing around him, and a note on his chest. It's very old. It's 1883, but you can you can make out everybody that's there. So that backs up what we've been told. We did a documentary on this last fall, or no, it was last year, the night of his. So we did it on the night of his lynching. We premiered it at our. So we, we're, we're doing a paranormal convention now. This year is our fourth. And it's called a freak out at the Fowler. So we demo or we premiered it. And in the middle of it, a woman stands up and she is flustered. And she's saying, this is not right. These are lies. I can't stand this. And so she went and talked to the director and he's like, okay, what's your problem? None of this is true. This is not how I, you know. And so she came over and talked to me and I asked her, I said, well, who are you? She said that I'm the niece of Ada Atkinson and our family not, and just went off. And so we talked a little bit more. And she said, well, that person, her cousin, he's not telling the truth. So now we have opposing stories from family members. His side of the story was the family, that all the things that happened happened that was negative. They, were, they weren't upset that, that he got his justice, that things he had seen when he was a kid. And she said everything was the opposite. She remembered and understood it. So there's our new controversy. So her her side of the story is that her family did not believe Jacob had actually killed Ada, that, and that none of the people from the community had actually uh, had had been a part of this, but it was people that were in for some Civil War reenactment. And none of this we can corroborate. We, we said, you know what? We can redo parts of this to add in your side of the story. Just let us know. But then we never heard back from her. That was so, so more than fair of you to offer that. <laughs> yeah, we want the truth. We yeah. don't want to to alienate anyone that's got the truth or the true story. But what we do feel comfortable at least knowing is that, you know, Jacob may not have done it. So maybe he didn't do it. And then he really didn't get his day in court to prove himself innocent. And to me, that sets up, that kind of scenario to me sets up a haunting because... He has unfinished business. You know, you would want to clear your name. 
somehow, right. or you can't rest in peace. You can't. Well, and I think about two. So those are the things, those are the two pieces of history we know about, but we know that justice in the 1800s, early 1900s was probably its own form of justice. And there mm-hmm. could be other negative energy scenarios that are there as a result of something like where Jacob was, was locked up two cells down. We often get more activity there than we do out of Jacob's. And so some of our working theories are that maybe there's some energy there from the person that was there that night. And he was thinking, Oh crap, they're going to take me too." you know, that who knows what drove some of it to be, I'll say negative in that spot, but again, could be anything. We just don't have a lot of that history. You never know, you know, when they were giving out justice in the basement, did somebody accidentally die? Did, you know, did right. being chained up to the wall truly drive them crazy? And then that energy stays. And What kind of activity have you, or um, maybe you've talked to some other investigators, what kind of acti- activity have you picked up on there? So my first experience, I was down in the dungeon. There's a part of the, there's a part of the basement area that goes from records room to evidence room to cells. And I was watching an SLS camera and it's pointed down the end of this short hallway. And there are two, the, the original entrance doors are, are laying down there and they're on their side. And I'm just watching intently and I see about the size of a, my fist, black object go down the length of the door and behind it. In my right ear, I hear a heavy breath and I say, hey, Pete, my friend, I said, did you see that? I turn around and no one's standing there. Oh, So, yeah, that was my first, that was my first experience of anything unexplainable. But in that same area, we've got audio of two women are having a conversation and one of them, her name is Paige. And at the very end of the audio, uh, they say something and you hear this creepy voice just go, Paige. <sighs> and they both just got up and, you know, got to go. And they, they left. So that, that was one of their experiences. Um, we've heard growls down there. I've heard what sound like a heartbeat. I'm trying to think of other, other scenarios. But it's very close to the old evidence room. I'm thinking in terms of evidence. If you have had something in there like a shell casing from a suicide or a baseball bat from a fight or whatever, lots of negativity in that space. And then just around the corner is where the, the cells are. And if anybody got chained to those walls more negativity, more um, just bad experiences, I guess. Oh, yeah, because could you imagine being chained to a wall, no matter what you did? You could have been a murderer, but that that could basically make you go insane. If yeah, you were it's chained pitch black there. down there. There's, if there's no light from the side windows, it's just you and maybe some mice running over your feet or a bat flying around or other people down there with you crying, moaning, not wanting to be there. But we've that we've had we've had uh, I I will say there's not a consistent thing that happens every time, but people have been touched. There have been growls heard in several different locations. And I'm not gonna say demonic, just growls. And I don't know, you know, if it's a go spirit of a dog that got stuck down there. But it's um it is definitely a a different vibe versus the theater where it just feels more welcoming. Yeah. A little sadness imagine. because we think we have a couple of kid ghosts in the theater. And I was reading that, that there's the ghost of a child in the theater. What do you think? Like how do you, did you hear any stories of a child that was a, perhaps died in the theater or theater or, Maybe, you know, his parents worked there and he loved it or something. Any ideas? So two possibilities. One is maybe a child died when it was a, when it was a um, hotel. And oh, true. That, yeah. Yeah. So that, that to me is one connection. Before it was the theater, in 1907, we had two trains collide head to head. Just like right, I'll say right across the street. We don't have the exact location, but... 25 people were killed, 9 to 11 of them burned alive, and some of them were children. And so that's another working theory is that, you know, they they died out in this on the train tracks in this field in this open area. And, you know, could they have made their way over seeking refuge in the theater? 
But we have a picture of what looks like a young boy backstage. We have two audio clips of a kid calling out. The first one, it just sounds like a, sh a kid shouting. And several of the 765 crew are backstage. Two people are in the auditorium, and I'm in the concession area. I never heard anything, but everybody in the auditorium and the backstage heard that will like sound like a little boy call out. A year later, we had a group in from Chicago. They're just, it's a husband and wife team, and we're talking about the concession area. And they capture something that we didn't know about till they did a review at home. And it sounds like the same voice of a little boy, but this time you hear a call out mom. That whole part of it really, some, there are times it kind of hits, hits the heartstrings yeah. when you think about it. That, I, and I would be, I would be okay if somebody wanted to help him home. <laughs> I know. Um, but we also wonder too, people have reported when they're in the auditorium, seeing and sensing things up high. Well, if you go back in time to when that was a hotel, that would have been the second and third floor. So maybe that's something that, you know, ghosts don't know gravity. Maybe that's part of what people see and, and encounter. I'm but, assuming they don't know gravity. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. But with the jail, is it primarily closed unless someone's doing an investigation? Or is it used for anything at this point on a day-to-day -day no, -day basis? I would say the closest thing I would say for another use. Well, the sheriff's department will use it for training their drug sniffing dogs. So they'll take them over there and let them try to go through the house and they'll, they'll plant stuff around and have them go find it. And then anything else outside of that pretty much is me. So I have the, the ghost hunts we do at least one a month. And then we do the paranormal convention and then we've done walking tours. Uh, they, they wanted to make it more of a museum originally and it just never quite took off and so I'm, I'm still doing some of those things, but it's not like you can go in every Friday at three during open hours or anything. And I did want to ask you about the freak out at the Fowler. You do that every, or is it freak out in the Fowler or freak out, freak out at? So the, the Fowler Theater is technically called the Fowler. Okay. So we do freak out at the Fowler. Okay. And that's every September. You've been doing that for a few years, right? Yeah, we started. We started in 2019. We had to cancel in 2020 because of COVID. Right, everything. We picked it back up in 2021, smaller scale, 22, 23. So this would this be fifth year? Oh, this might be our fifth year. Uh, yeah, so it's in the September, October. We did it in August a couple of times. It was too stinking hot, so oh, yeah. we pushed it to September, October time period. Last year we did October 7th, which was the anniversary of the death of the, the manager at the theater. But we also were competing with a lot of big events in Lafayette, which is where Purdue, Purdue University is. So it was, we weren't going to do well against something. It was, it's called Feast of the Hunter's Moon. So they celebrate the, the, the natives and the, the uh, pioneers that came through at that time and over at a place called Fort Wyatnon. Well, people from everywhere go to that. So they weren't going to, not saying that we would have had a huge crowd, but we got to pick our battles a little mm -hmm. better. Right. But it sounds like a really fun event. And it's like two or three days. Uh, it's most. It's actually mostly one full day and then an overnight investigation. Okay. Uh, we have, um, we don't charge our vendors to set up. Last year we had 15 maybe. And we're not limiting it to just paranormal. But the first year we had Bigfoot researchers. Um, we had people just selling shirts. Um, one guy, um, he was selling paranormal artwork, beautiful artwork. And we have them in the lots to the east and west of the theater. We do walking tours. So we start at the theater. We go past the the, op the old opera house. And I, I lead that. And along the way, I share information about each location. We have a we have a house in town that we don't stop and tour, but we call it Murder House. In 2014, a woman there had been found dead oh. um she had killed her boyfriend and left him in a storage unit in chicago and then she'd killed her mom and left her basically I, i'll say i don't know if it was completely chopped up but in such a way that she would fit into a trash can in the back oh of the house oh my god yeah and then we then we go by the the jail and the old museum fowler's got a got a, and I'm, no, I'm sure we don't corner the market but we have a lot of these weird tales of, you know, uh, was it 
2020, 2021, a gentleman was, his house caught on fire. When the, when the police went there, they investigated, they found out that he'd actually been killed before the house was put, set on fire. Uh, two guys had broken in and attempted to rob him, and then they accidentally killed him. So they hit, they lit the house on fire to hide their tracks. And so we're, you know, you got all these little yeah. small town tales. You're like, what the heck is wrong? And, and What's going on here? Town that size, everyone would have known him or encountered him and, right. or knew of him. And same with yeah, the poor it, woman. Well, she was fairly new to the town. Um, That's crazy. But we go back to, to 1960. And this is some of the stuff that I had covered just doing research. 1960, there was a boy. He was 13. He had shot and killed his sister. She was 10. And some of the stuff I didn't even know about until someone reached out to me on the, you know, the, my Haunted Fowler page and said, did you know about David Llewellyn? So what we found out from the newspaper perspective, he was, he had a, a 22 rifle in the house, in the kitchen. He said he was cleaning it. It went off, shot at his sister. He covered her in it with a sheet, left her, left her in the yard. Story is that if they had, she'd gotten the attention she needed, she might have lived, but he just left her there and didn't tell anybody. Mm. Well, then all the emails come in the back, back channels and say, well, you know, he, he was good friends with the manager. He always befriended him because he was kind of weird and people weren't very nice to him. And, you know, there's nothing that says he's in the theater, but he died in prison for um, some pretty heinous crimes as an adult. So if there's any negative, you never know if maybe he's passing through. And he could be. He's Another story. Very attached to that town. Yep. Wow. Now, what's the best place for people to get information if they want to come to town and investigate and, and look at both the theater and the and the jail, okay. as well as information for Freak Out at the Fowler? So the best place to start for any of that is the Fowler, is FowlerTheater.com website. So from there, we have all of our events listed. And uh, Freak Out of the Fowler is part of the Fowler Theater events. But we also have a page dedicated to paranormal. So you can go there and read a little bit about, there's not a lot of detail there, but just enough for people to get a sense of the, the, what's what's happening, or what's available at the theater, what's available at the jail, and then how to schedule. Uh, we are, evol again, being all volunteer. Um, we're spread pretty thin. I got two people right now volunteering for the investigations. So because of that, a lot of the, the scheduling is, you know, working with people to find out what date works for you. Well, this date works for mm -hmm. us. Well, we can't start then because the movie's starting. We have to. So there's a right. lot of back and forth, but it's not painful. You know, we make it as easy as possible. And sometimes we have to push people back a month or two from where they would like to be. Um, but we we're trying to be very accommodating. So in the little treats, if you go to, if you do investigate the theater, you get free movie popcorn and drink. Um, well, I say free, you're paying to be there, but right. uh, we want to... A, a you know, little snack get, and drinks while yeah. you're there. You go to a theater, you got to have movie pop. Right, so exactly. we want to throw that in there. And I will put a link to that on the show description. So you can okay. read about this show and just click on it right there, wherever you're listening. Yeah, and we have links from there. So I try to put anything that we record in the theater and or the jail on... YouTube for my haunted Fowler, um, mostly because it is the easiest way to watch a video. Yes. You don't have to have a YouTube account. You don't have to have an Instagram. You can just watch a video. Mm -hmm. So I find that's the easiest way to share. And there's lots of content on the my Fowler page on Facebook. Yeah, my haunted yes. Fowler. There's a there's a lot there for people to see because I think you had that video of the hat that you were talking about on there. Yeah, so that was at my house. That's up, yeah. up there. Uh, just this Saturday, we have it had a film crew in there doing a documentary on the theater. And during my interview on stage, we're just doing the interview. The director comes walking by. We all hear a noise, all but one person. I thought it was his shoe squeaking on the floor. But everybody's looking at the back of the auditorium. He goes and checks up front. It sounds like a woman's voice. He checks up front. There, there's a guy who's there doing drone footage. He's like, I heard, he didn't hear anything. So we go back and we watch the security camera. And it sounds like a woman yelling out. It's just a quick yell. But um, so it was kind of cool. And those are the times I think 
are the, some of the most most enjoyable because we weren't trying. It yeah. just happened. And that one you're talking about, listen to that one with headphones. It'll help you hear it. Because I, I listen yeah. to it and then I put on my headphones and listen to it. Yeah, it, it's, it it, it's hard to hear or it's quick. It's quick. If yeah. you're trying and definitely don't try and listen to it in a crowded room, people talking. Exactly. But this was a really interesting conversation. I just really now need to see both of these locations. <laughs> I don't know if I could be in the jail overnight. That dungeon thing kind of creeps me out, but I would brave it. Yeah, we've had very few go much past three o'clock. Not the big because they're running scared. We typically just people want to, and it's the kind of thing you can see the whole jail in that five hours. You could find that you are running up against time because there's so many nooks and crannies, so many different places. And, you know, you want to hit them all, but I would say at least compared to like a huge old sanatorium or prison, you know, we, there's not that size you have to try and cover. So you can hit yeah. a lot of like where the women's dorm was, where the men were kept, the dungeon, the, the, the family residential space. You can hit all of those and spend a good amount of time in each. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me tonight. I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. I appreciate you reaching out. And that wraps up our conversation with Dwight Sneathan about My Haunted Fowler. For more information, as well as information about paranormal investigations, Visit their website at FowlerTheater.com or search My Haunted Fowler on Facebook. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advance episodes, you'll get everything commercial free by becoming a gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts where you can try it for three days free, or you could go to Patreon.com slash The Grave Talks. I'm Carol Hughes, and for all of us at The Grave Talks, thank you for listening. Thank you.